About a year ago, I was pondering fatherhood and how brilliant and exciting it is to be a dad. And I'd stayed up late one night watching a sort of horror film on the TED website with uh, Sir Ken Robinson talking about how schools are crushing the creativity of our children. And, um, I, thought, I started to think about how we can combat that as, as parents and how one of the ways to do it is to fill our, our homes with wonderful and uh, stimulating things which would uh, you know, make any child um, stimulate their curiosity and things. And uh, although I live in Devon, I also live in Twitter and I thought that I would ask the people who live with me there in Twitter what they thought about the idea. So I, I sent a tweet I said, there are certain things that every home should have just for the sheer joy of them. A tuning fork, a metronome, a good magnifying glass. Magnets, a section of wasps' nests, a snakeskin. What else would you recommend? And true to form, people of Twitter replied to me. Sam Randall said, something that, sh that shouldn't be musical, but thanks to pioneering 1970s technology is. And Corky said... We had, for a very long time, a desiccated newt called Norman. <laughs> Emma Irvin said, a child's handmade clay canopic jar or two from their Egyptian project. And Roberta Spicer said, a full-size cross-legged mannequin with hand missing and a bag with two long plaits of 25-year-old hair. <laughs> Jane Gallagher said, a box full of spare teeth which the tooth fairy left. Very poignant. Alice Buckley said, old stamps, foreign currency, an ink pen that you're not allowed to use. <laughs> and Simon Evans replied with, I'll go further. An entire room you can't use Monday to Saturday. And some things from your father's time in service, hats, swords, etc. An office boy said, ticket stubs from a 1978 recording of Are You Being Served? And there were plenty more of them. And, uh, you know, lots of people came up with their ideas. Uh, Martin Carr suggested bell rope. Uh, Charlotte Ross, a horse-shaped cake tin. Um, and I thought these were just beautiful ideas that were thrown at me, and I've gathered them all together on my website, and you can, you can see some more of them. Uh, a small fossilised dinosaur poo, and they, and they very kindly sent me a photograph of that as well. Oh, seem to have gone... So, uh, when Julian asked me to do this, I thought, that's fantastic. I can take the idea of creating this idyllic home environment and I can extend that to the city and I can get Twitter involved in coming up with ideas again and that's what I was coming to talk to you about but um, as happens with Twitter it didn't quite work out like that and something rather wonderful happened instead and I'll tell you about that in a minute but first I'll tell you a little story about me dreaming up ideal cities is what I thought I was going to be doing with my life uh, once upon a time and I suppose since I was a little boy I thought that I was an artist, but I, I, I didn't think, as I grew up, that you couldn't really... I, I didn't think I was capable of making a living out of it. And I also thought that calling yourself an artist was... You just couldn't do that. You had to earn the title somehow. So I thought that I could marry my creativity with my desire to make the world a better place uh, by becoming an architect. Uh, so I fell in with an architect's practice. Well, first of all, I say, should say that... it. it fairly quickly dawned on me that I wasn't really that bothered by things like shadow gaps and using the right materials and the correct and magnificent uh, masses brought together in light, as Le, Cor Le Corbusier said. Uh, but I was interested in people and places and, and the things that people got up to in, in, in spaces and things. So uh, I worked with this architect practice that specialised in listening to people and this was at you know, the beginning of the New Labour project uh, when the idea of public consultation was seen as being very important. Obviously, you know, we do it all the time now, but we were pioneering new ways of going out into communities and listening to them as architects and talking about their environments and how they'd improve it and, and things like that. Um, and we travelled up and down the, the country and we went to some of the most deprived areas in the country and they were having money thrown at them. And underneath it all, I had a sense that this wasn't necessarily going to change their lives. Um, but, you know, at least we'd been listening to them and listening to their stories and trying to find ways to represent 
their views and make them heard. And I hope you can see from these slides that uh, this was the kind of architecture I was involved in. The, the buildings have completely disappeared and what you're left with is a kind of network of people who just happen to be in a certain place at a certain time and, and shared a certain interest. So jump forward a few years and uh, here I am calling myself an artist at last. I got to that point where I got confidence to do that and I've got an exhibition on in a local gallery and I think this is an opportunity to try and do a bit of a participatory project. So I asked people in a visitor's book to give me their pet name and their favourite words, quite simple things. And this drawing came out of that. I had about sort of 350 odd people responded to that. And uh, here they all are. And, you know, this is, I found it very touching as I was writing it, as, sorry, as I was drawing it up because You've got sort of family ties and the kind of affection and the playfulness of language and the love of language, all the things that really appeal to me, brought together by a huge group of people, well, a huge group of people, you know, a fair-sized group of people who shared a common sensibility, I thought. You know, they were all kind of sensitive to this idea of how precious these things are and... Um, I put them together in this drawing, but it took me about two months to get the information. Um, so, luckily, now I'm on Twitter, and I found this was a place where the way my mind works is perfect for it. I make silly little jokes and bits of wordplay and occasionally tweet my pictures, and there's an appreciative audience out there who seem to enjoy that. And they're not just an audience. Uh, it's a kind of creative endeavour, I think. And we're involved in a kind of creative partnership, writing the never-ending story of Twitter. And I didn't really want this presentation to be something with a kind of narrative arc that takes you through to conclusions at the end of it. Actually, I want to let the voices of the people on Twitter actually talk to you directly. Um, so I'm going to finish off by just telling you about this thing that happened a couple of weeks ago, and it's a story in tweets. And uh, I'm just going to kind of read it to you, and you can draw your own conclusions whether it's got anything to say about creating an ideal city or you know, the future that lies ahead of, ahead of us. Uh, so here we go. It was my son's seventh birthday. We played a game in the garden. And the next morning, I wrote about it on Twitter. OK, those weren't tweets. That's just me setting up the next bit. The next bits are tweets. Yesterday, we had a small party for our seven-year-old boy. We played the game of wyvern eggs, which we made up last summer. Wyvern eggs. I, the wyvern, I think you might be able to see me in the picture there, lie on my back on the lawn with my eyes shut while my children try to sneak up and steal my eggs, which are footballs. It is very enjoyable, especially because small children are bad at things like hiding and sneaking up. They're much better at it now that they're seven and eight. OK, so Alice Charlton replied with, brilliant game. Our game, two lines, all generations walk towards each other chanting, a bogus, a bogus. Laugh and you're out. <laughs> uh, you're all going to be playing this afterwards. Played at in-law's 50th anniversary. I mean, just the age group is fantastic. From mother-in-law's family, start low, build to loud, then down while creeping. I mean, I just thought this was so beautiful. So, of course, I retweeted it to my followers, and replies started to flood in. And here's some examples. This is from Lils. I am one of four girls, and we used to play something called Bucking Bronco. We all climbed on top of my dad, and he had to buck us all off. Last one, clean on, was the winner. And she said, when I get home, I'll tweet you a picture of us all stacked up on top of him. Here's Bucking Bronco in action. From bottom, Jesse the dog, Dad, <laughs> Rosie, Madeline, me, Amy. Age order. She seems very pleased with the fact it was an age order. <laughs> so Amy Gro Godfrey. I'm just going to read you some of these games that people... <laughs> we played... OK, you're reading it yourself. OK. <laughs> Uh, it's just a beautiful idea. How are we doing for time? <laughs> Alison Moye, yes, said, try this. You need to make a smile by clenching your jaw, avoiding all other expression. 
especially in the eyes. I love this game. <laughs> Elizabeth Jarvis. We did crow settle when I was small. An adult placed their hand on your head, wiggled their fingers and said, crow settle. <laughs> Dora, 1925. Best game ever is crap lookalikes. <laughs> Best one spotted was a crap Mr. Meeker from rent a coast <laughs> Bob Nelms. Well, this is more of a solitary game, but when working for 118118, I played a game to see if I could get a caller to say I love you to me. <laughs> Tess Tickle. I'm not sure if that's a real name, but we played shops with Gran. We made Play-Doh peas and sausages and newspaper fish and chips. Then we actually made her eat it. <laughs> Fantastic. Son of a joiner said, my, I love this one. My niece invented the pesky moon game. We sit by the back door, shaking our fists at the moon, saying, clear off, pesky moon. <laughs> Gee, Vanala, I don't know how you pronounce that, I'm sorry. The dog has a game. The dog has a game. Any place, any time, he'll suddenly keel over. Human participants must then tickle, scratch, etc. Dog wins. Okay. <laughs> Dan Rebellato said, my brother and I played a game that involved eating dry cornflakes from a bowl without using your hands. It was called horses. Karis <laughs> yeah. Munns. Me, I mean, you know, these are brothers and sisters. You know, me and brother have a competition of who can put largest food items in each other's cups of tea without the other person noticing. <laughs> Gives you a shock sometimes. It's okay. Okay. A power, this is a driving game. A power invented glasses, no glasses. A motorway game. Select a car, you can overtake. You're always ahead of me slightly. I, I've realised there's a slight fault in this. Yeah. Anyway, you've got to decide whether the driver's wearing glasses or not. Check out. There were lots of driving games, but some of them are a bit more well-known, I think, that, that, um, you know, like cricket and things on the, on the pubs, you know. But uh, what I love about these is they're kind of made-up games. How am I doing for time? Yeah, for, OK. Natalie Farron, has anyone suggested the donut game? Me and my dad would sit in car, eat a sugar jam donut, loser licks their lips first. Yeah. Lilies and Loves. My bro and I also used to dance on the landing like Morris men while singing, I'm a baker's fisherman, over and over. No idea why. Well, we know why, don't we? Because it was joyful and a wonderful thing to do. Paul Litchfield. My brother and I used to play a game called Brock Monster. The Brock Monster had to move very slowly while saying Brock. Fun. Fun. It's just fun. It's mother's work. Also one where adult at a family gathering just lies on the ground with an arm or a leg in the air. Eventually one of the children won't be able to resist pressing the limb to the ground, so adult, adult pops up the other leg or the opposite arm, etc. Child lets go first and rushes to restrain the second. Sophie Gadd said, me and my sister played a game on holiday where you have to try and make weird noises next to tourists videoing. <laughs> David Powell. On long car journeys with my sister in the middle, my brother and I would play head tennis with our shoulders <laughs> bouncing it back and forth. It. I like the way he calls it it. That's his sister's head. Back and forth with our shoulders. First one to wake her up loses. I can't quite see how long we've got. One, one minute. OK. Look, I'm going to run through. Oh, just, I just like Martin Carr's ones here as well. Monkey machine. Don't pile on the Paolo. Do you want squash? All dangerous. You know, it doesn't say what the details are. Okay, so the last, yeah, I'm onto my last slide, that's perfect, good. About, we're back to dads again, I think these are fantastic. Whenever we got a toy that came in a box, dad would make us play orphans and pretend we lived in the box. <laughs> <laughs> these are just so beautiful. My dad used to put us in a cardboard box, then put us somewhere around the house and we had to guess where we were. <laughs> we played uncontrollable arm. Daddy raised his arm in public and flailed it around until we squealed with embarrassment. As kids, we used to play a game where we'd pull one of the few hairs on my dad's head. Yeah, I know this one. To see if he woke up. If he did, you lost. And so I think just right back to the beginning, Will 73 said, Baghead, Dad would put a brown paper bag over his head and stomp after us around the house. Terrifying. Anarchy. Another made-up name, I think. My father, too, had the hand which was possessed and would try to strangle him while he fought it off. Thrillingly terrifying. <laughs> and finally, Eliza Doolally, my dad played Dracula and chased us around the house with his false teeth hanging out. <laughs> terrifyingly brilliant. And I think these, this is what these were. So a tribute there at the end to terrifying and brilliant dads. Thank you very much. Thank you.